Amen. <clears throat> well, I'm it. <laughs> um, well, we are, the last time we, we looked at prayer, we looked at some things of prayer. Um, um, I read some things to you. Still hear me? Okay. And uh, I want to kind of go over some of those things that we covered last time and go over them again. Kind of reiterate some of those things again. <clears throat> um, I read to you some quotes. I read to you a quote from James Montgomery from a, a hymn called Prayer is the Soul's Sincere Desire. And the one part of the hymn says, quote, Prayer is the simplest form of speech that infant lips can try. Prayer is the sublimest strains that reach the majesty on high. And so I thought that was beautiful because prayer is the, is the, um, it's, it's the simplest form of speech. Even little children can do it. They can, they can, they can pray. Um, where other things they may not be able to enter into, but they can pray. Um, and all, so, so the Lord has put that out there for everybody. Um, he wants us to come like little children. So um, little children can pray. And then prayer is so deep. It's, uh, it's sublime. It's, it's, uh, it's infinite in its grandeur. So it reaches children. Children can reach out to God. And then it's whew, higher than Mount Everest, higher than the heavens. It's huge in, it, in its scope. The, another quote was um, by an anonymous uh, writer who wrote the book called A Kneeling Christian. And it says, prayer, <clears throat> real prayer is the noblest, the sublimest, the most stupendous act that any creature of God can perform. And we looked at how that is true with many of those who have gone before us, who have done exploits in the Lord. Um, how they have had that emphasis on prayer in their life. Um, Mr. Wesley, John Wesley, he spent two hours daily in prayer. He began at four in the morning. Of him, one who knew him well wrote, he thought prayer to be more his business than anything else. And that's something, knowing that... Um, we think of him for his preaching. We think of him for traveling on horseback all over, preaching open air, um, and the revival that took place there um, that God used him in. But he says prayer was his most important business. Uh, I think those things wouldn't have happened if he hadn't had prayer as his number one business. Those things wouldn't have, wouldn't have come forth. They wouldn't have burst forth if prayer wasn't that to him. Um, then we looked at uh, Dr. Judson. I think his name's Adoniram Judson. And he was the first <laughs> real missionary to go out from the United States to take the gospel. Uh, and he took it to Burma. Yeah. And um, the Lord did mighty exploits through him in, Bur in Burma. Uh, he had no converts for many, many years, some six years. But then uh, he's there over 20, 20, over 20 years. And at the end of his life, there was over 200,000 converts or so. And Burma was changed. Um, but in large part to this, it says, Dr. Judson's success in prayer is attributable to the fact that he gave much time to prayer. He says on this point, quote, Arrange thy affairs, if possible, so that thou canst leisurely devote two or three hours every day, not merely to devotional exercises, but to the very act of secret prayer and communion with God. Endeavor seven times a day to withdraw from business and company and lift up thy soul to God in private retirement. Begin the day by rising after midnight and devoting some time amid the silence and darkness of the night to this sacred work. 
Let the hour of opening dawn find thee at the same work. Let the hours of 9, 12, 3, 6, and 9 at night witness the same. Be resolute in his cause. Make all practical sacrifices to maintain it. Consider that thy time is short and that business and company must not be allowed to rob thee of thy God. And so we see uh, just a couple examples there of men who have done uh, mighty exploits in the Lord who their main business was, was prayer. Their main business was prayer. So the scripture says those who know their God shall do great exploits. And there's no way that we're going to know him more but by spending time alone with him in prayer. Much, much time. And it's not to compare ourselves with these other men and try to be squeezed into the mold and be exactly like them. But the point is, we just need to spend much time with the Lord and, um, and grow in that. So we see that um, prayer... We looked at this last time. Prayer and faith are the two most foundational, um, foundational things in the scripture. Prayer and faith. Um, the, there's nothing more foundational in our relationship with the Lord than, than prayer and faith. Um, they go together. And when someone truly begins to have faith in the Lord, when someone truly begins to have faith in the Lord, there's going to be prayer coming out. It's, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. It's just a result of faith. And when faith begins, true prayer will follow. It's a sign of true faith. So it's something that we need to examine ourselves and see where we're at in that. What's coming out of our life. Is, is, is prayer coming out of our life? Is that something that's springing forth out of our life? It is, is it our business? Um, remember Jesus said, my father's house shall be called a house of prayer to all nations, right? A house of prayer. And we are the temple of God. If we're born again, our father's house should be a house of prayer. The foundation of prayer or prayer at its most fundamental level is in the Bible calling upon the name of the Lord or crying out to God. That's prayer at its most fundamental level. It's foundation level. It's calling upon the name of the Lord or crying out to God. It's throughout the whole scripture. And I likened it to a little bird that has been hatched and is in the nest and it instinctively opens its mouth and receives from, from the mother bird. It opens its mouth wide. And in um, Psalm 81.10, God says to Israel, he said, open your mouth wide that I might fill it. And so that, that's kind of a picture of what we need to be like. Um, when, when, true faith, when true faith is hatched in our life, when true faith is hatched, then there's going to be coming forth uh, an open heart, open mouth, crying out to God, calling upon the name of the Lord. There's going to be that coming out of true faith. Just as the little bird, when it's hatched, is going to start opening its mouth um, and receive. And it's going to make some sounds. There's going to be some sound coming out. Uh, you, you hear the little birds chirping. When, they're, when they come out, they're chirping. They're, they're, they're looking to get something, to receive something. And... Um, that's what we need to be like. I thought of it like uh, we had the thunderstorms. We had those big thunderstorms, you know. We've had a lot of them lately, a lot of, a lot of rain. And um, not too long ago, well, we had the biggest one that we've seen since we've been here. How long ago was that? That was like th two weeks ago or something. You probably remember all that lightning. Just, just it was like I'd never seen it here before. And... Um, it was so bright that it's like I couldn't even, you know, looking out the back window, I had to turn away because I couldn't, I couldn't even look at it. It was hitting like all around the house, just 
I had never seen it like that before, but you see the lightning, <coughs> and then what happens? <laughs> Bow! You know? Right? <laughs> Louder than that, but, but it's like, you know, you see it, and then, and then it, it, you, you, it can't help but shake you a little bit, right? <laughs> you know, it can't help but shake you. And you think, man, those who say they don't fear God, you know, I'd let them go stand out in that field, let some lightning bolts hit around them and see if they won't shake, see if they won't tremble, you know, tremble before that. Um, but just like uh, prayer follows faith, just like calling upon the name of the Lord and crying out to God follows true faith, it's, it, it, uh, thunder follows lightning. It's just like that. There's the light, okay? And then there's the sound, boom, okay? And that's what it needs to be like in our life. God's light comes, light comes, light has come into this world. Men love darkness rather than light, right? But those who do the truth come to the light that their deeds might be clearly seen that they've been done in God. Clearly seen. We, we're not ashamed. We, we make sounds for the Lord, right? That light comes in and boom, we make some sounds now for, for Jesus, you know? We were in darkness. We made sounds for the enemy. We made sounds for the enemy for a long time. A, a lot of filthy sounds. And... Uh, but now, now we have true faith in the Lord. We, we let no unwholesome words proceed out of our mouth, but only words that are such for, for edification, that it might impart grace to the hearers. And so that's what true faith is going to produce. It's going to produce fa- prayer, calling upon the name of the Lord. It's going to produce more, more vertical desire. You know, God comes in, whew, you're going you're, you're you're to be lifting up your hands. You're going to be looking to him more and more. You know, not less and less. And um, I thought of this lightning thunder analogy kind of. uh, And I thought of the Apostle Paul's conversion and um, relating to this, how prayer follows faith, how calling upon the name of the Lord, crying out to God follows true faith. Um, It's interesting because the Apostle Paul, we know, that he had an encounter with some bright light, right? He got blinded. Speak about, you could have been like lightning. Jesus is coming again like lightning flashing from the east to the west. It's going to be bright. Every eye will see. He dwells in unapproachable light. And so when Paul is on the road to Damascus, he's ready to imprison and possibly kill Christians. He's an enemy of the Lord. Um, We know that the Lord initiates the Lord, the Lord initiates and, and sends light. And uh, the scripture says that in John chapter 1, that God gives light to every man coming into the world. God has given light to every single person. He's given light. And he gave light to the Apostle Paul there. So in Acts chapter 9, if we, if we turn there, see something here of how calling on the name of the Lord, crying out to God in prayer is birthed out of faith. <coughs> Chapter 9, this is, this is uh, the Apostle Paul's conversion here. And so we know that the Lord appears, a light shone around him from heaven, he fell to the ground, so that's bright light, you know, that's, that's, uh, could have been some noise behind it, you know, I mean, that's, could have been lightning, I don't know, but it knocked, it's so bright, it knocked him off his horse, it probably, you know, scared the horse and flew him off, and, well, it's a, it's a wake up, <laughs> awake, awake, rise from the dead, Christ will give you light, so he, he um, Gets knocked off, he falls down, and the Lord says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? (coughs) Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And now in verse 6, we see that there's some trembling, just like I talked about. You stand out in that field of lightning, you're going to have some trembling. If the Lord knocks you off of a horse with blinding light, there should be some trembling now. Okay? 
this second time when he says, who are you? Okay. And he finds out who he is. Then there's some trembling because he has been fighting against him. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick, kick against the goads. So he trembling. Now there's some fear. By the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil, right? Trembling. We're supposed to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. This is good. Something's happening in him right here, right? Something real is happening right now in him, for sure. So he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what do you want me to do? That's total different. Added. There's, there's a change that happened right there. Some, some major change just happened in him, right? He's now, he's now instead of, who are you, Lord? Like, like, like Lord, like you're, you know, he didn't think it was Jesus, you know? Who are you? Now he knows it's Jesus. Jesus is Lord, right? And he trembles and he says, he calls on the name of the Lord here. Lord, what do you want me to do? That's submission. That's submission. That's surrender right there, right? That's, that's what I'm talking about. There's some, there's some belief that's happening here. He's believing this is Jesus. I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. He's believing now. It's him. There's some repentance going on here too. He has some fear. He's, he's trembling. Okay? And there's some belief starting to hatch. Some faith. And then we see him call in the name of the Lord. Lord, what do you want me to do? He's calling on the name of the Lord here. And that's, that's what I'm saying. It's a, it's a foundation uh, for all prayer is, is this calling upon the name of the Lord, this crying out to God. So then we move on and we see that in verse 9, um, he's fasting now. He obeys, right? Obedience and faith are synonyms. So um, Romans talks about the obedience of faith in Romans 1 and Romans 16. The obedience of faith. There's, there, if there's no obedience, there's no faith. There's, there's, so there's real faith going on here. He's obeying the Lord. Repentance, faith, calling on the name of the Lord. He starts obeying him. And now he's fasting for three days. He's fasting. So this, his faith is growing here. Change is happening in him. And then we see that in verse 11, the Lord speaks to one of his disciples, Ananias. Arise and go to the street called Straight. Inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. Behold, he is praying, God says to his servant. Now he's praying. He's fasting and praying. He's called on the name of the Lord. Now he's obedient. Now he's going further. He's fasting. Now he's praying. And for sure he's praying like he's never prayed before. You know that Saul of Tarsus prayed. He said lots of prayers. There's a lot of, lot of people that say prayers, but they don't pray. And he would have been one of those. He said prayers, but he didn't pray. Behold, and none of it, none of it impressed God before. You know, because he knows. He knows what real prayer is. He knows where our hearts are at. But now, there's a transformation. He says, behold, he prays. And he tells him that, see, prayer is a sign to Ananias here. Prayer is a sign to him that he's changed. This is, there's real faith that has happened in him now. And this is a sign. Behold, he is praying. Behold, he's praying. So, prayer is, is a, a sign. Um, when there's prayer, when there's much prayer, just as I read those quotes, when there's much prayer in someone's life and brokenness, contrition, and um, that's usually a sign that, that someone's faith is growing. When there's less and less prayer, um, that's a sign that someone's dying. Okay? But it's bursting forth here in, in Paul. So, 
after Ananias goes to him, he says in verse 17, if you notice, he says, Brother Saul. Brother Saul. Calls him brother now. God, you know, Ananias is a true disciple. I think he has discernment. Someone God chose for a very, very special mission. You know what I mean? How'd you like to be the one to go and to lay your hands on Saul of Tarsus and see him change into the Apostle Paul who wrote most of the New Testament? And, you know, we've all, we all give glory and thanks to God for his life, right? So he says, Brother Saul, I think he is brother. I think he's transformed. He's a brother now. Okay? And so what happens next is, of course, he, Brother Saul, he lays hands on him. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. Scales fall off his eyes. And then he's water baptized, um, which is a public declaration, confession of what has actually happened spiritually inwardly the death burial resurrection the new life and then we see the progression further verse 20 shortly after that he spends some days with disciples at damascus immediately he preached the christ in the synagogues immediately he preached so we see a whole progression of salvation here um, how there's repentance, there's faith, there's calling on the name of the Lord, there's fasting, there's prayer, right? There's being filled with the Spirit, there's water baptism, and then he's preaching. It's, it's, the, it's the perfect uh, example of what God desires to happen in, in, in all of us, I believe. Um, So it's the same with our conversions. If we, look at, if we look back in our life, we can see where God initiated the relationship with us. He initiated it. We responded to him. He initiated it. He brought light into our life. The gospel came into our life. Someone came and shared light. God brought light into our life and, and humbled us, knocked us off our high horse. And uh, <laughs> we saw ourselves in truth, right? Yeah, that's right? Brought light into your life. Then you saw yourself clearly. You saw how dirty you were and you saw the Savior. You know, what do you want me to do? And uh, instantly, after that faith is birthed, then you have prayer coming forth um, to the Lord. So it's the same with our, our conversions. And um, I thought it's interesting to think about our, how our spiritual birth, um, our spiritual birth begins with light. Um, and crying out to God. And I, I was thinking about that relating it to our physical birth because we've all had a physical birth. Yeah, exactly. I was thinking about that, how um, we're in darkness in the womb, right? We're in the, we're in the darkness in the womb, and we come, we come forth, we come out into the light. And what do we do after that? We cry. <laughs> we cry okay so same thing as we looked at Paul's conversion our own conversions light came in okay we came out of darkness into light we cry out to God we cry out to God just as and we depend upon him we put our dependency upon him um, we we just had our 4th of July right so that's uh, they say Independence Day but I had a brother Joaquin he texted me he said he said, uh, may, the, may the body of Christ declare its dependence upon him. And uh, I thought that was good. And that's, that's what, when we're, when we're saved, we are crying out to him. We depend upon him. Just as that baby comes out of the darkness into the light, cr starts crying, right? Starts crying. And then to the mother, the mother cares for the child. Same thing with us in our spiritual uh, birth. Same thing. The Lord does for us. He cares for us. And um, that crying out is the, is the, the fundamental uh, foundation of prayer. That crying out. Just as the baby comes forth, and he cries out. And it's a, it's, a, it's a sign of birth. 
the baby comes out of darkness into the light and cries out. If there's no crying out, if there's no crying out, then uh, and there's no calling on the Lord, then that's a sign too, right? That would be a sign. That would be a sign in a physical birth. If there's no crying, that'd be a sign of something not right. No crying out. Um, same thing with someone who says they name the name of the Lord and there's no crying out to God. There's no prayer in their life. It's, it's not a good sign. Something's wrong, um, just as it would be with physical birth. And there's some, there's some verses I was looking at. Um, the Bible speaks something about the, the wicked, something that they don't do. Um, just as I said, it would, be a, it would be a bad sign if someone says that they're a Christian, but there's no crying out to God. There's no prayer. Um, let's turn to Psalm 14, uh, verse 4. And look at a few verses here. Psalm 14, verse 4. Have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call on the Lord? Workers of iniquity do not call on the Lord. Something they don't do. They don't call on the Lord. Turn to um, Psalm 53. No calling on the Lord is a sign of no life. Psalm 53, verse 4, it says, Have the workers of iniquity no knowledge who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon God? Same, same thing as saying there. The workers of, iniqu of iniquity, that's a sign. That's something that marks their life. They, do not, they don't cry out to God. They don't call upon God, not even in that fundamental way. That's, that's where the beginning of salvation takes place, that calling out on God. They don't have prayer in their life. That's a sign. That's a sign. No prayer in someone's life is a sign. could be a sign of a worker of iniquity. Okay? Turn to 79 verse 6. It's like I, I ask people often something else. I ask them um, when they, a lot of people will say that they're Christians, right? I'll, I'll ask them, um, uh, what, did you, what did you read in the Bible today? And they say, oh, well, you know, I didn't, I didn't really read today. You know, I, I, I haven't, you know, I read, you know, a few, you know, maybe five days ago. And uh, I said, well, you know, the Bible says that as a newborn babe desires the milk from its mother, so... Someone that's born of God desires the pure milk of his word. As, as a newborn babe, babe desires the milk from the mother, you're going to desire the word. And the same, same with prayer. Born again, there's going to be that crying out. There's going to be that prayer bursting forth. There's going to be a hunger for the word, and there's going to be a desire for, for prayer to, to, your, to your father who, who loves you, you know. And um, 79 verse 6 Pour out your wrath on the nations that do not know you and on the kingdoms that do not call on your name. So, the nations that don't know him, um, the kingdoms that don't know him, they don't, they don't call on the Lord. There's, there's, no, there's no prayer. There's nothing vertical going on in their life. Everything's horizontal. I remember before, I, when, I was, when I was lost, everything was horizontal in my life. Everything. Everything. It was all about you and you and, and as my wife, <laughs> she says, it's kind of funny. She, she says sometimes when she's preaching, 
you know, something you all caught up and he said, he said, he said, she said, and what she's thinking. And how do you say it, honey? Oh. He said, <laughs> what she looks like and what, he, what he dress says she's she, wearing. Or what yeah, yeah, yeah. Like. Yeah. Right? I mean, when we were lost, isn't that, we were caught up in that? It's all about, you know, other people and what they think. And, and we want to be, keep up with the Joneses, you know, in this area and that area. We want to be like this person and we esteem that person. And there's nothing happening this way, you know. And so here's what it says right there. Those kingdoms, they don't call upon God. That's a sign. Uh, Israel, in, in its history, has called upon God. Israel, as a nation, too, has called upon God at different times. There has been times that Israel has called upon God. Um, so there's a distinction being made there between them and Israel. Jeremiah 10.25 Jeremiah 10, 25. Pour out your fury on the Gentiles who do not know you and on the families who do not call on your name. Whoa. The families that do not call on your name. For they have eaten up Jacob, devoured him and consumed him and made his dwelling place desolate. But families that do not call on, there's his name are not right with him that's a sign you know we know we know families that don't call on his name i think all of us know families that don't call i mean i know you just went you visited your family and i know you were sharing testimonies about that you can see there's there's families that don't call on his name they're they're not calling upon his name and um that's a sign of someone that doesn't know god Seventy nine six. So they they won't call because of their their iniquity. They drink in iniquity like water, the pleasures of sin, which are passing pleasures of sin. They're only for a season, right? They're only for a season, but they are pleasurable. But they are pleasurable. And they don't call upon him because they don't esteem him pleasurable. They don't esteem him pleasurable. They're not calling upon him. And Psalm 66, 18 says, um, if we regard iniquity in our hearts, then, then he won't hear us. So there's those who don't call because of their iniquity. They're not calling upon God. And then there's those that God won't hear because of their iniquity because they're holding on to it. He won't hear them. They don't call and he won't hear. So it's total disconnect, right? Until, until they let go. They let go of that iniquity. They, 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 they have a, a humbling experience. Praise the Lord that he brings humbling experiences, experiences like he did with Saul. He brings humbling experiences into lives to break them down. Praise the Lord for that. I know he did that in my life. So... In reality, there's those that they don't want, they don't want the light now. And um, they don't want the light right now. And they want to stay in the darkness. And the sad reality of that is that you think about eternity. They're going to have darkness. God will give everybody what they ultimately want. Every one of us, what we want, what we truly desire, God's going to give it to us in that sense. You want darkness, he's going to give you darkness for all eternity. You want the light, right? There's no need for the sun in his kingdom, right? And, and, and he is the light. The light just proceeds forth from him. And uh, we're going to get to enjoy his light. Wow. Uh, I mean, praise the Lord. You know, you, rainbows, and, amen. And a, and a river of water of life, crystal proceeding from the throne of God. Light coming out. Oh, man. Yeah. Praise the Lord. And you think about those that they don't want to cry out to God now. 
then they cry forever. They're going to they're they're cry forever, ultimately. There's weeping and gnashing of teeth. They're going to cry forever. But praise God, today is the day of salvation. <laughs> today is the day of salvation. And whoever calls upon the name of the Lord today shall be saved. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, we know Acts, uh, Peter speaks that in Acts 2.21. Okay? Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 10.13. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So the question is, does that mean just saying a prayer? Is that what that means? No. Right, brother? Yeah. It doesn't mean just saying a prayer. We already looked at that calling on the name of the Lord has some stuff preceding it. It's not just a prayer. You just pray this little prayer, sign it in your Bible, and you're good to go. Because God hears your prayer. No, there's got to be some repentance, some faith, maybe some trembling, some astonishment, some things like that behind that prayer. Okay? Some calling upon the name of the Lord. <coughs> Lord, what do you want me to do? Just like, just like Saul, right? Lord what, Lord, what do you want me to do? He knows Jesus is Lord. He's confessing Jesus is Lord. He just said, you're Lord. Lord, what do you want me to do? You tell me what to do and I'll do it. Anything. And he did it, right? So we know that it, it doesn't mean just a prayer. We've already seen that repentance faith comes first. And let's turn to Romans 10.13 real quick and, and just, to, just to look at that real quick, just to see that it does mean that. Romans 10. Romans 10, 13. So many, a lot of people misuse this verse, of course. Okay? In different ways. In different ways. Okay. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So you just take that out and people can twist that and say, okay, it's just, they put their own meaning into it. They don't do any study behind that and just, 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 just call on, Jesus. You know what I mean? They could just say um, the sinner's prayer. Some repeat after me. Repeat after me the sinner's prayer. And, um, and they say, okay, you called on the name of the Lord. But look at verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? That shows you something right there. And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard. And how shall they hear without a preacher? So, obviously, if you just read a little bit in context, a little bit, then you see that it's not just a prayer you pray. There's, there, how, can, how can they call on whom they have not believed? That's got to come first. There's got to be that true faith that's birthed, coming from repentance. And... Um, responding to that light that God's brought into our life, you know. So, we see that uh, calling upon the name of the Lord follows faith. And I believe it's the foundation, foundation of prayer. There's so much more to, to prayer. So much more depth to prayer. It's just the beginning. It's, it's something that's the foundation of it. And um, there are those that believe, though, that calling upon the name of the Lord has nothing to do with prayer. Has absolutely zero to do with prayer. There's those that believe that. And these groups are, are those that believe in what's called uh, baptismal regeneration. That's, those are the groups they believe it has nothing to do with prayer. What they believe is that calling upon the name of the Lord is water baptism. That's what they believe. They believe calling upon the name of the Lord means to be water baptized. And unless you are water baptized, there's no salvation. And that's calling upon the name of the Lord to them. That's what they, that's what they say it is. And um, salvation doesn't come until after water baptism for them. And so there's groups that believe this. The Roman Catholics, they have this idea. Um, the Churches of Christ uh, and the International Churches, Church of Christ believes this. And um, the, some of the Lutherans, they believe this as well. Um, the um, Orthodox, Orthodox churches. 
and uh, many of the Anglican churches also have believed that baptismal regeneration. Um, and with that belief, you know, it makes sense how they would have a hard time with the Acts 2.21 and the Romans 10.13. Um, how they would have a hard time with those verses. And they, they, they try to say that that's what it means. So I thought I would look at a couple of these. Where did I put that? Mm -hmm. I had a paper here. Hold on one second. Where it went. Hmm. Okay. Oh, there it is. Hallelujah. Can't see the forest through the trees, or is that what they say? Okay. So, um,. I, I, I kind of compiled some verses and different things. I, I compiled a little bit too much, I think. Uh, <laughs> but it's, it, you know, you run into these, those that have this belief. It might be good to have a couple things to, to look at. Um, okay. Okay, so I was thinking if, if, uh, if water baptism was necessary for salvation... Um, we'd expect to find it stressed wherever the gospel presentations in the scripture are, are going forth, right? <laughs> if it was that important that you had to be water baptized, then any time there's a gospel presentation going forth or how to get saved, or, it'd have to be in there if it's that important. So if you look at uh, Acts 3, 12, you, know, you can just write these down, maybe look at them later, but Acts 3, 12 to 26, and Peter gives forth another gospel presentation um, forgiveness is linked to repentance not baptism at all um, in Acts chapter 2 the verse in verse uh, 38 I believe is the one that they hold on to um, repent and let every one of you be baptized okay um, but when you look at Acts 3 um, Paul gives a whole gospel presentation and it has nothing to do with water baptism at all. But it's, the forgiveness is linked to repentance. In Acts chapter 2, there's still repentance, okay? And forgiveness of sins. And then there's the water baptism there. In Acts chapter 3, it's just repentance and forgiveness of sins, okay? If it was mandatory that you had to be water baptized, it would be there too. It would have to be there if, if, if that was true. Um, 1 Corinthians 15, we know that that's, uh, that's the gospel going forth, right? Paul is saying, this is the gospel that I, that I received, and I, hand, and I deliver it to you. So that, that's pretty important. It's, a, it's a really like a creed, right, brother? It's really like a, it's a creed of the early church, the 1 Corinthians 15. He goes through the gospel that I received, I delivered to you, that Christ <laughs> died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and he rose from the dead on the third day according to the scriptures, that he appeared and he goes through the gospel message there. Nothing of water baptism um, there. And he says in 1 Corinthians 15, 2, he says, By this gospel, when he goes into explaining what it is, he says, By this gospel you are saved. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And he says, By this gospel you are saved. There's no water baptism there. Just, believe, just, just repenting and having putting faith in that gospel right there is what he's talking about. Uh, also, Romans 1.16 says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then the Gentiles, neither of these verses um, tell us what saves us, they include any mention of water baptism. Yeah. Um, 1 Corinthians 1.17, another important one. Paul... Um, says he was not sent to baptize. The Apostle Paul. I was, not, I was not sent to baptize. Wait a second. How can that be? If you have to baptize people for them to be saved, water baptized, and Paul says, I was not sent to baptize. we got some problem there. Either Paul is a false apostle, 
or the Church of Christ is a false church. Could be. I'm not declaring everybody in the Church of Christ that way, but I, but there, but especially the International Church of Christ. This says you have to be a disciple in the, in, in in the International Church of Christ, and they have uh, a lot of false doctrine. So they're they're borderline classified a cult, as far as I know. Uh, you probably know, you might know more, but International Church of Christ, I believe, is, and they really push that. Um, 1 Corinthians 1.14, Paul said he was thankful that he did not baptize any except Crispus. So Paul's thankful that he didn't baptize any. They, they need to be baptized to be saved. And he's thankful, so he's thankful that people aren't getting saved. That w- if, if you hold to what they're saying. Um, Acts 13.38-39 um, be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified from all things. Nothing of water baptism. Acts thirteen thirty eight and thirty nine. And then you, and then if you look at the um, those who were saved, who were saved apart from baptism, you have uh, Luke seven thirty seven to fifty. That was the, the penitent woman. Okay. Forgiven. Forgiven of sins. Um, Matthew 9, 2, the, the paralytic man. No water baptism. Uh, Luke 18, 13 to 14. That was the, uh, the publican, the tax collector. Right? This one was justified, Jesus said. Just shall live by faith. And uh, the, the uh, Pharisees weren't. Remember that? They were, I'm glad I'm not like this tax collector. And, and the tax collector, you know, beat his breast. Have mercy on me, a sinner. Yeah. And then the thief on the cross, of course. He wasn't water baptized. Luke 23, 39 to 43. And I was reading a little bit on that. They have, you know... A lot of these groups, they have all these different ways to try to overcome this stuff. They say, oh, well, that was, he died before the new covenant. But the thing is, the thing is, actually, Jesus died before them. He was already dead. Then they broke their legs. So actually, he died under the new covenant. If you want to get really technical. (laughs) If you want to get really technical with them, you know. Get hung up on these technicalities, you know. Yeah, well, but he did. But see, the thing is, he died under the new covenant, so and he wasn't water baptized. So, that's what I'm saying. So according well, to them, according to them, yeah. yeah. And John fifteen three. Remember, Jesus said that the apostles were cleansed. He, they were cleansed because of the word that he spoke to them. Remember that by the word that he spoke, they were cleansed, and uh, it wasn't any water baptism. So that's John 15, 3. Um, also, uh, Cornelius, and, and these, are, these are ones I was looking at that were, um, they were saved before they were baptized. So Acts 10, 43 to 48, um, Cornelius was converted through the apostle Peter, right? And received the Holy Spirit before baptism. And so... My thought was, does the Holy Spirit indwell unsaved people? Never, right? The Holy Spirit's not going to indwell an unsaved person. That's impossible, right? So therefore, Cornelius was saved before water baptism. After that, you know, what's, for, what's forbidding you to be water baptized? Well, see, the only thing that was forbidding him from being water baptized was what? <coughs> Salvation. <laughs> In, in truth, that was the only thing. So he's saved. He has the Holy Spirit. He's dwelt with the Holy Spirit. He gets water baptized. So that's a really powerful one. Acts 10, 43 to 48. Cornelius is saved before water baptism, which creates a problem there. Um, so there's many other things. And 
I'll, I'll probably stop. I'll stop there. I can give you guys all some more of these later. I could spend probably another hour on that. <laughs> but it's pretty important. I think that's, that's, that's an essential to contend for because that's salvation. And any time they're messing with salvation, what salvation is, that's something to contend earnestly for. The faith once for all delivered to the saints. That's, that's tweaking with something of the faith once for all delivered to the saints, right? So that's something to contend for. Okay. Um, so in Acts 2.21 and Romans 10.13, that's a problem for them for obvious reasons. Okay. Um, but I believe it's foundational to prayer. Uh, they're both taken, both of those, uh, Romans 10.13 and Acts 2.21, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord, are both quotes uh, from Joel uh, 2.32. Joel 2.32. If you turn there. pretty powerful actually 30 to 32 and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth blood and fire and pillars of smoke the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord and that's at the end okay these things are happening before and that's at the end the last trumpet at the end of the tribulation and it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Shall be saved. And the word there for call is um, transliterated uh, uh, kara. So you say kara. It's like K-A-W-R-A-W. Kara. And... Um, there's two other words. That's, that is a primary word used all through the Old Testament, that kara, that calling on the name of the Lord, that, that word for call or cry. The other words that are primarily used for prayer uh, in the Old Testament are pal palal, palal, and um, that means pray, and that's used all, these are the two other primary words for, for, pray, for prayer, palal and tefillah. That's prayer. So palal is pray and tafila is prayer. And they both have a, have a different meaning from the kara. They, um, the, those two words for prayer, they mean to intercede, to intervene, to interpose, to make intercession, to make supplication, to mediate, and to entreat. And totally different. It's like a, di it's like a deeper level of prayer. Okay? that you see there with those words. The kara is a more foundational, and it's, it's used all throughout the Old Testament. Um, I'll show you the difference in how, it's, how many times it's used. The two prayer words. Palal is, is, is used 84 times in the Old Testament. Uh, tefillah for prayer is used 77 times. But uh, kara, the word for calling on the name of the Lord, crying out to God in the, all those different ways, is used 734 times in the Old Testament. So it's, it's used a lot more, and uh, you'll see that in how it, how it applies to prayer. And it, um, it has a different meaning. It's more intense. It's more desperate. It's more of a desperate, personal-type word. And uh, it means call. It means cry. It means utter a loud sound. It means direct speech. It means call to someone. It means cry for help. It means call with the name of. It means make a proclamation. Okay. Um, it means to read aloud. There's times they read the scripture aloud. They use that. That was the kara. They're reading aloud the scripture. And it means call someone's name. It means to give names to. And it means to call by name and to be called. Um, those are, those are the meanings of the kara. <coughs> and uh, you can see why that would be the foundational for prayer. That's foundational. That's where prayer really gets its beginning. 
with that. Uh, and there's some very important uh, principles to learn as you, as you look through the scripture at the word kara and um, calling on the name of the Lord. And so if we go back to Genesis, you see the first, first time that that word is used, uh, kara. Genesis chapter 3. This is, uh, this is the first record that we have in the scripture of any two-way communication between God and man. Um, and, you know, basically, if you think about it, that's what prayer is, right? It's, it's communication. It's communion. We commune with him and we communicate. He <laughs> communicates with us. We communicate with him. And that's what prayer is. And so in Genesis chapter 3, it's the first time the Hebrew word kara is used and it's God calling out to man. And look at verse 9. We know that um, Adam has disobeyed God and they hide themselves. And then in verse 9, it says, Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? And that called is the kara. It's the, it's the first time that word is used. And um, where are you? And so this is the first time that you have communication that takes place between God, that we, the recorded, that we have recorded. So he said, I heard your voice. In the garden. So we know the kara is a, is a voice, something he could hear. Okay? We know that about the word there. I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And so there, it's the first time that you had that communication between God and man. God calling to man and then man talking. First time it's recorded. And the word is used there. And so there's many, many things that I was looking at it as uh, principles of prayer as I was going through this. And the first here... Um, God calling to, to man um, is that these are just foundational principles to think about when we think about prayer. Is that God cares about us. He cares about us. He cares about us, each one of us, more than we care about Him. Do you believe that? He, he cares about us more than we care about Him. It would be blasphemy probably to say, I care about God more than he cares about me. Probably, right? That would be like probably border blasphemy. Ignorant, yeah. But I wouldn't be able to claim ignorance. <laughs> so we, we see here that uh, the Lord God called to Adam and he says, where are you? He cares about him. He comes to him. And so that's something that I was thinking about um, in regards to prayer as a foundation for our prayer that we need to remember God cares about us He cares about us more than we care about him. He cares about us more than we care about ourselves And he cared for us when we didn't care about ourselves if you think about it We were reckless in sin, you know We weren't caring for ourselves He cared about us when we didn't care about ourselves And so that's the first principle that I was thinking to, to think about for prayer um, this is the first communication between God and man. So there's some principles here. God cares about us more than we care about him. Number two, God desires to have a close personal relationship with each one of us. As we see that here, right? Individually with Adam. Adam he came to Adam. He cared for Adam. Where are you? He cares for him individually. He wants a close, intimate, personal relationship relationship with each one of us every one of us here that's god's desire that's that's foundational to think of in prayer you know just to just to let these things meditate on these things and, uh, and when you think about the privilege of communing with him god cares about me you know more than i care about him god desires that close intimate personal relationship with me and you think about that god desires to be close to me it's like when jesus walked here he 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 drew close to people that people wouldn't draw close to. That 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 reeked, you know? That 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 stunk with rotting flesh. 
He drew close to them. He wanted to be close to them. He wants each one of us to be close to him. That's precious. That should, that, there's nothing more precious than that. You know? I mean, we must be, a, a, in, especially in sin, a stench to the nostrils of God. Right? I mean, he's holy. And, uh, but he desires that with us and um, individually. He desires to walk. I think of that song, In the Garden. And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. What does that mean? None of, I, I've experienced that. Well, it means that he wants that individually for each one of us. Not the same. It's not like, okay, I'm just going to blanket everybody the same with the same exact relationship. No, no, it's not, it's not like that. I have a walk and a talk with God none other has known. And that's what, that's what he desires for us. That's special. That's precious. I mean, I mean that's, that, there's nothing more precious than that. Number three, when you look at this, the first place Kara is used here, um, Adam, where are you? God knows exactly where each one of us is with him. God knows. He's not, he's not saying, where are you? Because he doesn't know where Adam is. He's saying, where are you? To draw that out of him, a confession out of Adam, right? He knows where Adam's at, right? He wants Adam to know where Adam's at. Adam's, Adam is out of order, you know? He's lost. He's lost. And so he's helping Adam. And so same thing. God knows where each one of us is with him. He knows where each one of us is with him. He knows. And, um, and he's calling each one of us to a closer walk with him. He's calling each one of us to a closer walk with him. He wanted that with Adam, right? And, or if you don't have that walk with him, he's calling you to begin that. Okay? He's calling you to begin that. If you don't have that, he's calling you to begin that uh, walk with him. And those things are probably basic, but I think that there's some basic, fundamental, foundational things that we can meditate on, you know, and we can think about in prayer, about how, what God, God's heart for you, you know, God's desire for us, you know, who, what God's desire is for us. That, 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 that really uh, can motivate us to draw near, to draw near, you know what I mean? Uh, draw near to him. And... It's God's heart for us. Intimate communion and fellowship. The next place that you turn and you see this word used is in Genesis chapter 4. It's the next place that the, the word for call or cry or the kara is used. Genesis chapter 4, 26. And verse 25 says, And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and named him Seth. For God has appointed another seed for me instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. And as for Seth, to him also a son was born, and he named him Enosh. Then men began to call on the name of the Lord. And we looked at this a little bit uh, last time. And um, we know the background of this, okay, is that Cain has killed Abel, right? Abel was righteous, okay? His blood cries out from the ground. And God, uh, the, the line of Cain is departing from the Lord, okay? And uh, ungodly, ungodly line is developing from Cain. That's ungodly to kill, right? To murder. And so that's, that's the line that's beginning with Cain that is going away from God. So God provides another seed, uh, Seth, and then through his line is going to be a godly, a godly line. And so that's the background of that. Um, in Genesis 3, 9, we see God calling to man. Here we see the first place that we see man begin to call upon the name of the Lord, uh, crying out to God. It's the first place we see that. We see God calling out to man. Now we see man calling out to God. 
But um, as I studied a little bit more, we talked about some of these things. I studied a little bit more. And uh, I believe that um, this also um, can also be translated, um, then men began to be called by the name of the Lord, as I studied a little bit more. Um, but I believe, it, I believe that it actually means both. And I'll, I'll explain why. <laughs> yeah, same thing. It's, it's basic. It's, it's basic. Even if it's, even if it's translated in the, you know, there's, there's reason to believe both, really. I mean, when you look at it, you say, okay, the Septuagint translates it. Then men began to be called by the name of the Lord. Um, and you look at many commentators. They, they, many, there's more commentators that hold to that translation. Then men begin to be called by the name of the Lord. Um, and, uh, and then there's reason to believe that it might be that because in, in uh, Genesis 6, we see that um, the sons of God okay, saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves. And there are those that say these sons of God are angels that are entering in with, with, with uh, the daughters of men. But that's not, that's not logical. And so it makes sense that this is those who were called by the name of the Lord, this godly line of Seth, the sons of God. What does the Bible say for us? Jesus says in, in John 1, he says, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To be called children of God, sons of God. Same thing here. So, um, but then you have the King James Version that translates it like this. Then men began to call on the name of the Lord. You have New King James that translates it that way. Um, some of the commentators translate it that way. And so you have reason to believe either but what it comes down to is um, even if it's if it's translated then men began to be called by the name of the Lord it still means both because you cannot be called by the name of the Lord and not call on the name of the Lord <laughs> and the other way around if it's then men began to call on the name of the Lord only those who call on the name of the Lord have the right to be called by the name of the Lord so it really doesn't matter Either way, both, both are there. Both, both are there. So, um, so I, I believe that both are happening there. This is actually the, the beginning of, of God's one true religion. Uh, there is only one true religion. And what's that? Yeah. Mm hmm That's right. You can't have one without the other. Yeah. Can't have one without the other. So to me, that as I looked at it, that just solved it right there. Either way, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Either way, it doesn't matter. Um, but um, we see that this is the beginning here. Nevertheless, in Genesis 4 is the beginning of God's one true religion. And we looked at that a little bit last time. Religion's not a bad word. The Bible speaks about pure and undefiled religion, okay? And this is the beginning here of those who call on the name of the Lord or those who are called by the name of the Lord, um, separating themselves, okay, unto the Lord, you know, separating themselves for His purposes, okay, and um, beginning to call upon His name and uh, be called by His name. And so it's the beginning of, of this of God's true pure and undefiled religion and remember it's it's also to keep oneself unspotted from the world so when you look at them they have this this godly line they're they're departing from the world which is Cain the line of Seth right they're departing from the world you know they're they're that's pure and undefiled religion to keep yourself unspotted from the world so you hear you hear you have a godly line starting and this is the beginning of true religion the god's true religion um which is to keep yourself unspotted from the world and so that's what they're that's what they're doing they're calling on the name of the lord and they're not following the way of cain 
Um, so we see that there. Separating themselves from the line of Cain, which is the world. And in this, in this here, I see an important uh, principle of prayer that I was thinking about is we must separate ourselves from the world to truly call upon his name. See, to, to truly call upon the name of the Lord, they have to separate. They have to be separate for the Lord. Yeah. Amen. They have to be separate. And so um, that's a principle of, of prayer. To truly, truly call upon his name, we have to separate ourselves from the, from the world and, um, and to be called by his name. And I thought a song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, you know, a song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And then I uh, heard Ravenhill, Leonard Ravenhill, he said, um, I added one thing to his. He said, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely grim in the light of his glory and grace. But I thought we can add another part to that. Keep your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely grim or stay, dim. Stay strange. Stay stra Amen. Stay strangely grim in the light of his glory and grace. So... That's something in order for us to, uh, to, it's a principle of prayer, we have to separate ourselves. In order to really call upon the name of the Lord, we have to separate ourselves for him. And um, we cannot serve two masters, the Lord says. James 4.4, 4, friendship with the world is enmity with God. 2 Corinthians 6, 17, 18, come out from amongst them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch not what is unclean and I will receive you and you will be my sons and daughters says the Lord. So there's a separating from the world, pure and undefiled religion, keeping yourself unspotted from the world. You're separate unto the Lord. And now you, now you can have sweet communion with God. Right? That's a principle of prayer. We can't think that we can be a friend of the world and a friend of God. Can't think that I can, I can uh, <coughs> serve two masters. You know what I mean? I can be spotted by the world and unspotted. I can be serving God and serving Satan. I can eat from the cup of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Drink from the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. I, you can't do that. It's a principle of prayer. We have to separate ourselves unto the Lord in order to tr truly have communication with Him. And so that's a that's a principle. Colossians three one. Set your mind on things above. Three three one and two. Set your mind on things above, not on things on earth. That's what God says we need to do. In order to really have the mind of God, in order to have really communion, we need to set our mind on things above, not on things on earth. There has to be a separation from the world in order to have, the, have that communion with God. So that's, the Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. He says this solid foundation stands. That's what he says. It's in 2 Timothy 2.19. This solid foundation stands. It stands. Nothing's going to shake this. Just like the Lord knows with Adam. He knows right where Adam's at. He knows each one of us. He knows everything where we're at. The solid foundation stands. The Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. In order to have communion with him. That's a principle of prayer. And um, calling upon the name of the Lord. Um, typically in the scripture involves using your voice. It involves using your voice. I mean, it sounds really elementary, right? right? But, but you know, some people don't have a voice to use. They can still call upon the Lord. Yeah. He knows the language of the heart. Praise the Lord for that. Some people can use their voice, but they can't speak a language. But the, the, the scripture speaks of calling upon the name of the Lord, have using your voice and speaking with the language. A um, couple interesting verses. Job 9, if you turn to Job. Job 9, verse 16. And I made sure that this is, this is Job talking. You don't want to look too much at Job's miserable companions. They had some false stuff coming out of them. Right? 
a lot of false stuff coming out of them. Like we looked at like original sin, yeah. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Terrible, huh? And okay. Got, and got rejected at the end. Yeah. That's right. So verse uh, 16. If I called and he answered me, I would not believe that he was listening to my voice. That's the word kara. We know that the calling there, Job's talking about using his voice. He said, he, you know, he's going, he, he's, he's, you know, he's, he's having some serious trials, right? And, uh, but we know that Job, um, he also never charged the Lord foolishly. So he endured. None of us have had to endure this, what Job's gone through. Um, but he did say, if I called and he answered me, I would not believe that he was listening to my voice. So calling voice, it implies using your voice. And then um, Zephaniah 3, 9, if you turn there. Digging into our Bible. <laughs> Zephaniah. Someone's got to name their child Zephaniah. I've never, never met a Zephaniah. Call him Zeke for sure. Zeke? No, Zeph. You do? Huh. Okay. Zephaniah. Okay. Zephaniah 3, verse 9. For then I will restore to the peoples a pure language that they all may call on the name of the Lord to serve him with one accord. That's, this, that's the word kara right there. That's the calling on the, calling on the Lord that they might call on the name of the Lord. And he's going to restore, this is yet to come, but uh, restore a pure language that they may, call, they may all call on the name of the Lord and serve him with one accord. Um, that's probably another subject we can dig into. Interesting. But we see that there's language there. He's going to restore pure language that we can all, I think, my, I think it's going to be Hebrew. But, Shalom? <laughs> Shalom, shalom. Lahit or oat. That means see you later. <laughs> um, <laughs> so calling the name of the Lord, voice and language, which is, we, we all have that, right? We have voice and we have language. God desires communication with us that way. Um, calling on the name of the Lord, it involves stirring yourself up to take hold of God. This, this is a good verse, Isaiah 64. This is what, this is kind of defining what calling, calling on the name of the Lord is. This, this verse is really, really cool. Isaiah 64. Verse 7. And there is no one who calls on your name, who stirs himself up to take hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us and have consumed us because of our iniquities. May that not be said of us. May it be that we stir ourselves up to take hold of God. That's calling upon his name. That shows some kind of zeal, right? That shows some kind of earnestness, some kind of fervency in prayer. The effectual fervent prayer right? Of a righteous man avails much. That's what God desires from us. That, that's kind of what it implies here. There's no one stirs himself up. Stir up the gift that's within you. Isn't that, well, that's what Paul says. Stir up the gift that's within you. And uh, we, can, we, can stir, we can encourage ourselves in the Lord. We can stir ourselves up. And uh, I, I like the picture of that, to take hold of God, you know? And um, what's, that, what's that the Lord says that... Uh, the one, the, they take it by force. I, I can't think of the verse now where Jesus. Okay, okay. Yeah. And so, some boldness in the Lord, you know. The righteous are bold as lions. 
the, the wicked flee when no one pursues. And so um, we have a throne of grace that we come boldly before the throne of grace. Um, as long as we're not trampling grace. Calling upon the name of the Lord must be true and sincere. And with your whole heart, not just with words. That's, that's, a, that's a principle of calling upon the name of the Lord. It must be true and sincere and with your whole heart, not just with words. That's something we can meditate on. Um, there's a lot of really powerful verses that speak about that. Um, but I think, I'll, I think I'll stop right there. And then uh, we can continue with this uh, next, next week. There's so many more things that prayer, principles of prayer that relate to calling upon the name of the Lord um, that we can meditate on. Um, but those are, those are just some of them. And um, this subject is just, just it's very deep. <laughs> it's very deep. But this is foundational to it. So um, it was on my heart to kind of cover this part of it and go through it. Any, any questions or comments, thoughts? Yes, brother? I have a question regarding the, uh, uh, the baptism thing. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh huh. Oh, okay. Acts 22. Yeah. Got you. Got you. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Right. Well, it's actually actually um, the washing is. Um, if I look at that, look at that it's verse. Tied it's tied Lord. to calling on the name of the Lord. Yeah, yeah, um, it's it's tied to calling on the name of the Lord. It's not tied. I can't look at the verse right. I find it right now. But yeah, you're right, bro. That's that's exactly it. It's not tied to the to the water water baptism, but it's tied to uh, wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. That's that's what it is. And because we know that water baptism doesn't wash away sins, you know, you can go in the water and come up just the same. Um, but it's the blood of Jesus. It's the Lord Jesus. He's, he's the one that washes away our sins. Yes? You know, Isaiah, we were talking to some Catholics um, one time. Remember at the abortion clinic and they said that baptism saves you and Isaiah right. um, told them that he, he said uh, you, can, you can go and you can get baptized and go in the water of sinner, but you just come up a wet sinner. Yeah, that's true. That can happen for sure. Yep. If you don't go in the right way. <laughs> yes, brother? Yeah, another thing when we look at the baptism issue, we can't just say every time we see the word baptism that it's talking about water baptism. Right. Uh, the word just means immersed. Right. Uh, that's right. So that's, that's what the uh, baptismal regeneration people would have you to do. You say, look, it says baptism. That's water baptism, and they, they do that in every single place it says baptism. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's not a good hermeneutic. Uh, a lot of these places where it mentions the word baptism, it's not even referring to water at all, right. and that's not even the context of the passage. Mm -hmm. So we just have to be careful that when we're doing looking mm -hmm. those passages, we're not doing that ourselves. Yeah, that's true. It's a transliterated that's word. That's true. Baptizo. Yeah, right. right. In the Greek. Yeah, I would agree with that. I just think the context of talking about that is the only reason why. It, it's a, the passage Sean bring up Acts 22 the same situation in Acts 238 the remission of sins there is connected to repentance right not connected to baptism yeah I know I know what Tracy's talking about it says, I don't know what verses Jesus said you know are you baptized and baptized and baptized and baptized and baptized right. talking about the, the suffering of the right John the Baptist says Lord come you after me he will baptize you with the spirit and the fire right. that's right Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. The exact example of what you were saying, brother, is in that uh, First Peter mm -hmm. yeah. three. 
that's the transliteration, the Greek baptizo, and uh, immerse it, it. It doesn't mean water baptism there. Right. Um, and even, you know, I was writing, not the removal of the dirt from the flesh. Um, it's, yeah, yeah. And, and which comes through repentance and faith, right. not, not through water baptism, a good conscience before God, a clear conscience before God. Um, well, bag baptism is, a, is doing what has, is, has a good conscience before right. God because yeah. God's commanding you to do it. Right. After you've gotten saved. Right. That's right. Yeah. And it can happen simultaneously, too. I mean, but in that, in that verse, it doesn't, right, right. doesn't mean that. Yeah. I mean, if, if right. you're, when you're talking about our salvation, biblically speaking, we should tie back our salvation almost synonymously with our baptism because it should be so close together to when we got converted, when we got saved. Shouldn't be tying it back to a prayer we prayed or action just in their heart or saying this in a prayer. Mm -hmm. you know, the, I think those things have taken the place of, of, of baptism mm -hmm. uh, in mm -hmm. modern day American Christianity. So, I guess in our in our fellowship, we kind of take the middle ground point from where most people are today and the Church of Christ because they go too far and they go too far. They've kind mm -hmm. of dismissed baptism and say, "Well, we can just do it on the quarterly baptism or the annual baptism meeting, whatever is convenient." No, you need to get baptized right away. Yeah. If you say you're a Christian, you've repented and forsaken your sins, you get baptized after you become a Christian. You know, when I was a, a Catholic, I don't know if I got Christian, I think pretty sure I got Christian when I was a, a baby. That doesn't matter. Right. That doesn't count. It could happen after you repent and believe. That's right. So. Amen. You know, I had a sad a sad thing that I wrote down here. Um, um, it was an article from the... Uh, Chicago Sun newspaper and it, it's it talked about the US military troops um, about them lining up in Iraq this is in 2003 to be water baptized um, because this 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 teaching was going forth over there somehow and uh, they were thinking that they they needed to be water baptized just to be safe just to be on the safe side so if they go out and get killed, they'll go to heaven. That's that was their that was what they were being told. And um, so, first of all, I mean, if you're getting water baptized just in case, then you're not right with the Lord at, in the first place. You know. Yeah, then you're not then you're not right with God. But that was a sad article to see that they were baptizing people just in case in case they get killed. They wanted to get it covered because they are under the idea that that was saving them, just the the water baptism. So that's a definitely a destructive, destructive teaching for sure. <laughs> any other, any other uh, questions or, yes, brother. Yes, uh talking about Ananias uh -huh. and it says that the Lord in a vision I spoke to Ananias and they said uh, behold I am here Lord and then after that uh, the Lord says to arise so I would I would assume that that would mean he was on his face praying when he got this vision but then he was given instructions he was given instructions to uh, go to a house of Judas uh, the one called Saul so he was given a name of a person he was supposed to go see. Mm -hmm. He was given a house that he was supposed to go to. He's even given the name of the street. Mm -hmm. He was given the exact address, the exact person he was supposed mm -hmm. to go see. And then also, uh, he was told that uh, Saul was praying. Yeah. So he was even told what Paul was doing. So he was given all this information, yeah. who Paul was, or Saul was, where he was, what street he was on. Uh, and exactly you know where to find them, and mm -hmm. then on the other side of it, uh, gave uh, Saul a vision, told him that a man named Ananias is coming to see you. Right. Yeah. Confirmation. And the reason why I'm I'm looking at that is because sometimes I think it's so easy to when mm -hmm. we're praying to not think that we can come directly to God <coughs> and ask him questions, mm -hmm. and that it's impossible for him to give us specific answers on things. Uh, sometimes we get this, uh, this thinking that, well, God, you know, he'll, he'll give me a feeling or a notion or a very mm -hmm. fuzzy, unclear idea, whereas I see in Scripture time and time again where God is very specific in His communication towards us, and it's not mm -hmm. vague or nonspecific, but 
oftentimes very specific. Mm -hmm. And just like what uh, Saul did, you know, what do you want me to do? Right. I mean, a lot of times that's what I pray. I was like, Lord, what do you want me to do? Amen. That's do a good. Do you want me to go here or do you want me to go there? And then uh, you can expect right. that you he expect will tell you. An answer. I mean, yeah. If you're walking holy, yeah. if you're not sinning against God, right. you're walking holy, uh, you're mm -hmm. seeking after his face, mm -hmm. uh, why shouldn't you expect that we're going to hear from God? Yeah. We should expect it. Yeah. That's right. Amen, brother. That's right. If I might share a testimony, I, I have to uh, kind of make an announcement anyway, but I wanted to share a testimony of prayer. I've been praying, um, actually since before uh, Jeff came down, that whether we should, uh, you know, see if his family might stay here for a little bit while they're transitioning down. So been praying about that fervently since they got here, and uh, the Lord led me to conclude that I, I we should invite them to, to stay for a month or so, and so they can make the, the smooth transition down here at the beginning of August. So I went to my wife this morning, which I normally do to, to confirm things, and she said, well, I've been praying the same thing, the Lord confirmed the same thing in my heart. So I went to Jeff this morning, to Jeff, well, this is what the Lord's put on our hearts, and confirmed to us that we should ask you to come and, and stay with us in August and um, so he's that's what I think he's going to do and uh, you know Lord willing he, he would move his family down and we just live down here and um, in the practical side of it that's the other part of the announcement I wanted to make is if if somebody could uh, host a young couple as part of that family and, and might uh, give us a little break on the load in the house and just practically speaking, if you have a spare bedroom or something, you know, so the septic tank will go crazy and there's a little extra breathing room and stuff, so if you uh, have an extra room, you might be able to host David and his wife uh, while they're transitioning down here as well. Uh, not that we would exclude you if we, if we can't meet that need other ways, but certainly um, I, I put that before the fellowship, mm -hmm. you know, so for you to consider in prayer that you might do that. Uh, to help David and Brianna uh, transition down here as well. So, uh, praise the Lord. Amen. And that was done through prayer. And, uh, Amen. Amen. God, uh, there's confirmation about it. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah, Josh? I just wanted to touch on the point that Mr. Tracy was saying about uh -huh. how God gives us uh, can, will, will and can give us specific answers and prayer when Cornelius, he mm -hmm. was given specifics, he was, uh, he was told that, um, he's called Simon, whose surname is Peter, he's lodged with Simon and Tanner, whose house is by the sea, mm -hmm. so he gave him, like, specifics, yeah. like, even his surname, so. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. We can't limit God. Amen. I think, I think, uh, you know, um, we should all probably have some testimonies like that. Um, and, uh, if we don't, the Lord, the Lord wants to give us some, <laughs> if we'll, if we'll give him more of ourselves, more of our time, um, give the Lord opportunity to, to do those things in our life. Uh, Cornelius, he was fasting and praying and giving alms and he was fearing God. And so he was definitely in tune to receive that, you know, I think, Probably to the degree that we're going to, as, as I read a few testimonies, to the degree that we're going to give ourselves to God, to that degree he's going to give himself. That's right. He's going to give us more details and more specific things in prayer. And uh, sometimes we, we let go too soon. We don't wait upon the Lord long enough. And maybe there's something that the Lord is going to open up to us. But we leave before the door opens, you know, and we take off. And uh, so we'll miss those things yeah. that way. I know I, 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 want to, I want to be that sensitive to him as well. So we need to endeavor to do what our, our part. God's, God's willing. <laughs> He's willing. He hasn't changed. So when we read those things, like you said, brother, we read it. He hasn't changed. He hasn't changed. We need to change. You know, we need to be changed from glory to glory, glory from glory to glory into the image of the Lord, you know, and be being changed 
And uh, he does that through prayer. And, you know, it's, it's, it's something to where we have to break through. I know you mentioned that. I think it was, oh, yes. I'm glad. Yes. I'm glad I. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> I want to play something about calling on the Lord. Praise the Lord. But breakthrough. Sometimes it, it takes, you know, you know, you, you got you to gotta go through some hard labor in prayer. Maybe you're not getting those details. You know what I mean? Maybe the Lord's testing you in prayer. And uh, he wants to see you're going to endure in prayer. You know? And uh, that's the test, I think. Yeah! yeah! All right, here we go. Can, can, is it okay if I pop I've been it? Uh, doing hair and makeup uh, as a freelance hairdresser and makeup artist, working in photo studios in New York and basically around the world for about 35 years. But in my very early 30s, I decided to move to Paris. Uh, because I wanted to be in the center of what was happening fashion-wise. And within two months of being in Paris, I got my first cover of Vogue magazine. When that cover hit the newsstands, um, my career just exploded. Now I was charging $3,000 a day, and uh, I was working every day. I had as much money as I wanted to spend on drugs. Suddenly it wasn't like pills and alcohol, now it was cocaine and then it started, then heroin came into the picture. One day I was on a photo shoot um, in New York City and uh, the model who was on this photo shoot was a very beautiful redhead and she began to talk to me about the Lord. God is in, God loves you and this, and I was like, you know, whatever. She, to me, she was a religious fanatic and I really didn't have very much to say to her. I just let her talk. Before she left, she said, um, hey, Dan, do you mind if I pray for you? Right in the studio, she just took my hands and she began to pray out loud. And I had never been around anybody praying out loud, you know. And I began looking around at people going like, you know, I just thought this girl's nuts. Before she walked out, she said, look, you know, you're in trouble. She goes, I know who you are. I've seen your work in magazines for years. And um, I know you work with all these famous celebrities, but you're in big trouble. And she said, so I just want to let you know that the day you call on the name of the Lord, he's going to set you free. And I said, oh, really? You know, like that. And I went, like, you don't understand. Uh, I've gone way too far. <laughs> you know, and so she said, oh, no, no, there's no hopeless cases with Jesus. And I was like, okay, whatever. You know, but listen, I will never call on the name of the Lord. That won't happen. And I won't ever come to your church. One of my contracts uh, was for a clothing manufacturing company and uh, we were shooting down in the Caribbean and I overdosed on heroin. They sent me back a few days later to New York and they pulled my contract on a morals clause and I didn't care. All I wanted to do was shoot dope. So one day I, I pulled a garbage can between my legs and I just began to cut up everything that had my name on it. Anything, passports, driver's license. I put the keys on the table and I just walked out and closed the door behind me and I never went back. And I began to live on the streets. Day-to-day -day existence on the streets of New York was, um, you wake up, you're sick, you need drugs. I'd gotten down to about 108 pounds. Uh, I developed hepatitis A, hepatitis B, hepatitis C. Every once in a while, you know, living on the streets, I would I would uh, go to a payphone and I would call Wanda and I would say, look, I need some money, you know, and she would go, well, if you would come by the church today, we have choir practice tonight, you know, uh, I can give you 20 bucks or, you know, whatever. She never gave up on me. She never gave up on me. Um, she never gave up on me. I didn't know it, but she had a whole team of like, you know, her friends out here all praying for me. And they would pray for me in prayer meetings, you know, where there's thousands of people there, you know, crying out to God. I mean, they would pray for me and pray for me. And, and you know, what did I know? I didn't know everybody was praying for me. I started developing a lot of phobias on 
the living on the street. I began to hear voices in my head. And it just began, it, it, it was constantly accusing me and constantly telling me how I would mess up. And then there was like another voice that started in and I could hear them both at the same time. And the other voice would just curse and just spew out filthy language. You know, there was a third voice that used to just laugh and laugh and laugh and laugh and laugh. I was riding the trains and uh, this, this guy who was like a drug addict who was also riding the train said to me, you look like you're dying. And he said, there's a hospital next stop. You should go to the hospital, you know? And I went, oh yeah, maybe I will. Because I didn't want to die on the street. I went into emergency and uh, I, was, I was sick. I mean, I was really sick. I don't know if it's something I remembered that Wanda had said to me or whether like an angel whispered in my ear, but there was like one moment where I just heard like a sweet little voice in the midst of all that craziness. And it said, the day you call the name of the Lord, it's gonna set you free. It was just at that moment that, uh, that I cried out to God, that it, it was as if the Spirit of God just swept into that hospital room. And it was as if he was all around me and all in me and healing me and loving me. I, I don't even know what I was experiencing, but it was, it was an overwhelming experience. And immediately all the voices in my head stopped. It was just that quickly. Demon's gone. Get him out of there. Get him out of there. And um, that's been 11 years ago almost, and they've never come back. <laughs> well, Wanda came back into the picture when um, I was in the rehab. I wrote her a letter, and I told her what had happened. And... Um, and she wrote me back a letter. It just said, like, it had three big letters on it, W-O-W. -W. I said, wow. <laughs> she, she couldn't believe it. I'll tell you the thing that blows me away more than anything is that God goes so much further than we ever dare to ask him for. You know what I'm saying? Like when I called on the name of the Lord, I just wanted to get out of a jam. <laughs> you know? I, 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 and, and God says,